It's a true delight to be here, and I want to thank uh, Intertrade Ireland and the Whitaker Institute uh, in having me here. Uh, can you hear me okay at the back? This microphone is a dummy for the video camera, so it's not doesn't actually project voice. Um, about four or five years ago, uh, five years ago, I think, uh, um, I was working with a group of uh, Western multinationals. And they were trying to put in a bid to enter India to, uh, to make solar panels. And uh, um, India has a big, huge um, national solar mission where the idea was to put one gigawatts of solar panels in the country over a 10-year period, which is a very ambitious. One gigawatt is a lot of electricity. Uh, so over a 10-year period. And, uh, and uh, so I was doing this workshop with, with uh, three CEOs who had come together to partner for trying to bid with this. And then we had a, a slew of others who were helping. And suddenly, about halfway through, one of the CEOs throws up his hand and says, I don't know about this. The Indians are so damn cheap. And then I was thinking about this. First, whether to get offended by this, because I, you know, by, by nature, I am Indian, um, even though I've become American and British on the way. But, uh, yeah, you know, I'm still born Indian. My identity is that. And then, um, and then I said, no, probably not. It's not about Indians being cheap, but I think cheapness itself is a virtue. Somewhere along the lines, we thought that being cheap is not a good thing. Right? And then we've become too posh and too sort of expensive along the way. And so um, for the past four years, my job, uh, thanks to our, uh, the British uh, Economic and Social Research Council, which gives out these grants, uh, they picked three uh, professors. Um, well, I would like to say eminent, but given that they've given it to me, uh, it's uh, three professors uh, to become professorial fellows. And then they said, you can pick any topic to study, just go around the world to find out how to do this. So I picked low cost innovation. And for the past four years, I've been studying that. And what I'm doing today is just giving you a lot of pictures and some principles. So I've, I go around and study these cases and understand how is it that people or companies come up with brilliant ideas but a fraction of the cost? And how can they make it work? Right? And uh, so if, if you have any questions, just stop me and ask me. I'm very casual about it. So, and if I do make jokes, please try to laugh as well. Right? Uh, <laughs> and if you do ask me questions, uh, please slow down just a tad bit for me to process that question. So the first sort of, sort of imagery that I'd like to have keep with you right, is, is this, uh, by the way, uh, I don't know how they turned it into the Intertrade Ireland green, but it used to be a white slide before. <laughs> Did you have anything to do with this? <laughs> but it is a white slide, at least on my screen. It turned a slight green there. That's OK. Uh, it fits well with the context. Um, it's nothing about these brands. By the way, I have several brands in this, uh, in this presentation. It's nothing about the brands themselves, but it's about the principle here. So here's this thing that somebody at Google, if you look at the if you Google images, you can find it. And it's taken under the Creative Commons license. You've, you sort of see, it says, just do it. And this notion that I cannot, I can't, is because, but, but if we tried a little bit, we could do it, right? So it assumes somehow that the context really exists for us to do something, that we are somehow empowered, but we're not willing to do it. Here's another slide on the same just do it theme, right? So, so the, there's a boy and a dog having a go at it. But, but it's not the just do it bit. Here, you think about this and you say the context, the kid is in a context and oblivious to the context. In other words, the previous one assumed that you can, the context exists, that it's an individual capacity. I cannot do it. While here, this whole just do it is just at the background. It really doesn't matter. It doesn't influence anything. So in other words, in fact, the context itself for me to sort of enable me to act on something doesn't exist. Many of my examples, you would think, has a development flavor to it. That it could, but that's not my intent. My intent actually is to find 
if we can do certain products or services at such a low cost, then our market for how we export or how we create new services, uh, whether it's British, Irish, or European, is we expect, ex we can expand our market uh, to much more than what we currently do. So it's to think about that that way. So let me take some random number. Uh, um, over the next 10 years, the expectation is 300 million Chinese in rural environments would move to their cities within China, right? So inward migration of, uh, into cities. Now, if you think about this, uh, 300 million is a lot of people, true. Uh, China is also a big country, true. But to build housing stock for 300 million people, China would have to take the entire topsoil of that country to build that housing stock. Clearly, China is not going to do that, right? Or neither is it going to allow Australia or any other country to give that topsoil, right? So what China would do then is to innovate, because it is forced to innovate because it does not really have a choice. In some ways, it is a hard constraint. And you then start asking, OK, how could it innovate? And if you start thinking about housing stock, it's likely to be in building materials. It's going to be in design. It's going to be in logistics on managing the construction process. Right? So the innovators for building environment or the built environment 10 years later will be the Chinese because they are the ones who face the hard constraints to create, come up with new solutions. So you start thinking along those lines and then say, whether it's access to water, infrastructure, or anything along those lines, then you start asking, who's going to come up with these new ideas because they have those hard constraints? For us, um, better or worse, we have become slightly more complacent over time, simply because we've not felt the constraint. But we are beginning to feel it now. And so the magic here is about how we start rethinking what innovation is based on the constraints and then saying, I'm going to place myself under hard constraints that makes me creative or come up with completely radical solutions that I would not have otherwise come if I had taken the existing uh, environment. So I'm going to come up with six principles. You would look at this and you'd say, of course I knew all of these before. But I'm going to give you examples of how these work in a context that force us to become innovative or rethink uh, cost in the innovation process. The first one is grand challenge thinking. Uh, any of you know what grand challenge, where that comes from? I'll give you a tenner. Or it'll be funny money. I'll give you 10 euros. I'll have to search for it, but I'll give you 10 euros. Otherwise, I've got 10 pounds in my wallet, but I'll give you 10 euros. <laughs> grand challenge. Anybody? Television game, close, not quite. A uh, hundred years ago, um, 112 actually, in two, nine, 1901, a mathematics professor called David Hilbert came up with, I think, 26 problems that he said, here are huge problems in mathematics which are not solved and likely unsolvable. Right? And he called those grand challenges. So if we solve each of those problems, then we would solve um, significant problems associated with mathematics and the applications in math, physics, and then spills over into natural sciences and applied sciences. I think in 112 years, I think we've solved 16 or 17 of those problems. If, you've, if you want a Nobel Prize or a Fields Medal, you still have nine shots at it, right? Um, but uh, then the United Nations and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation took this to say, here are huge problems that we need to solve. And the problems are like, for example, water or poverty or, or health and, yeah, or educating the girl child. Or these have become uh, grand challenges. How can I do this for, because it's a scale of the problem, and therefore you have to have a solution which is really low cost. Right? You can't have an expensive answer to a huge scale problem. Start off with pretty examples. Here's one. Uh, it's a nice little laptop compared to this one. This is one laptop per child, right? 
So the idea of a laptop itself is true, but there are two different models in how you can come up with laptops and what the purpose of how you think of that as a grand challenge. If you think of grand challenge as I have to take the price down so much that I would scale it drastically, then that creates a different perspective of how you're going to address the problem itself. So reframing the problem is also rethinking what your market is. And instead of saying, I'm going to address this, my addressable market is um, 20 miles around Galway or the, so somewhere in Ireland, you start thinking about what is an addressable market by going for something which is radical in terms of cost. So the, the first sort of thing, grand challenge idea, is to sort of think about being radical and asking, why am I really producing this product or service? What is, what is completely different? And in some ways, you'd say it's about purpose, right? I want to touch as many positive uh, individuals as uh, positively as possible. I want to scale up not just 10, but 100 or 1,000. For university education, our entire model has been based on educating 10,000 students or 15,000 students in a, in a, over, over a period of time. What if we released that and said, yeah, yeah, you know, there are about 4 billion people who are un uneducated in, in the world. How do we figure out a solution that would, uh, that would uh, be able to capture people in terms of lifting education through? So thinking about grand challenge in different ways. So the first thing is to be, think of a grand challenge and to be radical in that. The next one, I think, is to rethink the object. Uh, every product, in some ways, in, is an embodiment of an object, right? And you'd sort of say, if I can rethink what the purpose of the product is, can I then open up the market differently? Uh, a lovely water filter, you've seen this before. There are certain assumptions that goes into this product. What would be the assumptions? There is a tap water, yes. There is a tap, there is reasonably pure water, and it flows. Uh, yes, it's transparent, you can see it, it's all beautiful, right? It's beautifully designed, there's no question about it. Here's a different solution, right? This, this is live straw. It assumes that water is essentially not really water, and it also assumes that it need not necessarily flow. And it also assumes that there are going to be lots of critters or boogers in the water, right? And therefore, how do I get this $2 life straw into the hands of people who really need it at a cost, obviously, at a cost uh, basis, which is incredibly low, and then you give incentives for the channel to take it forward and your NGO partners to actually uh, sustain themselves from it. Here's another one in the Western context. Um, I have to switch between the videos because uh, I'm having a little bit of trouble on.
Very clever, isn't it? So what were you thinking when you were watching this video? Say it again. You can save the earth. You were feeling nice and warm and fuzzy. Yes, very good. That's part of what they want. Huh? Might use a lot of water. <laughs> Possibly true. <laughs> so when you think about this, Puma's business is in the shoes apparel business, right? So clearly they weren't thinking just about their shoes, right? They were thinking about the plastic bag itself and how could I make that a mechanism in which I could engage the customer? So while uh, I finished the experience, ended at the, the buying the shoe, I go home and I'm doing all this lovely thing. I'm feeling really warm and fuzzy. I'm stirring it and so forth. All the while I'm thinking, Puma is so awesome, right? <laughs> Isn't it? Because you're, you find this attachment to it in a way that, oh, yes, that is so very good, I, I, and you create this. And so what they've done in, in very simple ways is actually reduced cost for themselves, and they've created a greater attachment with you. That's innovation in a way that says, here's cost that I would have otherwise occurred, I'm reducing that cost, and I'll make you love me for it. So the, the second point here is very simple. Can I rethink the object? Are there ways in which I can reframe my constraints to say, Here's a product that I offer. Can I change the positioning a bit? Can I uh, sort of change the functionality? And what would that change in terms of experience? The third principle is life cycle cost. And here's, uh, all of you would have been thinking about life cycle cost uh, re as reusing materials. But I'll give you a slightly different view of this. I've got one such bag. This is Paul Smith. It's very lovely. I've got a different brand, but it's, it's like 400 pounds or 500 pounds. It's very expensive. It's very nice, right? Here's a different bag. It's 40 euros, and you can order it online. Have you heard of this one, Freytag? OK. So the principle behind this is, you know, the, the material at the back you can see are containers, contains sort of the branding material, the wrapper on a container. Uh, where a shipping container, right? And so what, what these guys did was they went to these companies, the container companies, and said, you know, once they finish that branding exercise, you'll have to dispose it anyways. So they said, oh, we'll take it off of you. No problem, we'll recycle it for you. And what did the shipping container guys do? They paid them to actually take it off them, right? So I go to the shipping container, take their material, the, the container guys pay me for it. That's fabulous. Then I come and set up a website. And then I ask you as a customer to design your bag. So you design the bag using the material that somebody paid me to do it, and you pay me for you having designed it. <laughs> That's sweet, right? So, so here's a business model that every time I have a customer do this, I have a, 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 a gross profit margin, which is actually more than my sales, right? Because uh, the cost of doing it is minimal. Somebody's actually paid me for the materials, and actually somebody's paying me more because, you know, to do the work that I should have done anyways. So when you're thinking of life cycle cost, you have to start thinking about not just the life cycle cost of your product, which a lot of companies are now thinking. For example, Unilever and so forth, the, the consumer goods folks are rethinking of packaging material and so forth. But they're rethinking their own packaging material. They're not thinking, how can I take somebody else's material, which they would otherwise pay to dispose, for me to actually come up with a new idea that would then create something. Um, the next one is specialized for scope. So how do companies specialize? I know, I know all of you know how to specialize for scale, right? Uh, uh, if I asked you what are economies of scale, you would come up with very nice answers. Uh, but let me ask that anyways, just to make sure we all know what economies of scale are. Anybody volunteer a guess? It's okay if you're wrong. You shouldn't be, but it's okay if you're wrong. You won't be. Anybody? Uh, that's it, right? So you produce more. 
So you take your overhead cost, you produce a lot more units, and therefore the cost per unit comes down. That's it, economies of scale. So now specializing for scope, though, is slightly different. So I, I do a lot of work in uh, China. This, is, this one is a cardboard manufacturing plant. And you do this, and you see these machines are for like 200, 300 meters long. You put stuff in front, and it comes out the other end. It's packaged, it's baled, and it's put, it's knotted, and it's like string wrapped, and it's ready to ship. So all you have to do is put stuff in the front, and everything else happens. Now if I want to change that a little bit, then it's a completely different problem. So if I wanted to do something at a smaller scale, um, then, then the challenge is that I will not be able to do it. So what this young girl is doing is actually making cardboard. So you didn't know how cardboard was made, but it's essentially sheets of paper, recycled paper, with glue passed through a sieve, and you put a paper again on top of it. The nature of the glue will give you the ridges, and once you press it, the glue falls in ridges, and then you apply the paper again. Right? So essentially, she's making cardboard. Now, uh, you, you don't need to watch the rest, but then the idea in this is very simple. Here's, uh, you know, there's this, all this lovely uh, thing about providing rural employment and scale at a lower cost and so forth, right? So this is employment that would have not otherwise been used, and therefore the cost, uh, cost per, per uh, employee is very low. Now, what would then what would it then translate into uh, is different. So now you'd uh, use that model. to create something else. What would you, now you've got um, flexibility associated with making this cardboard at an impossibly low price, right? In a labor market that you would have not otherwise used. And then they used this cardboard, which you would mock me, is to make houses. And they make these houses at $2,000 per house and it's fully waterproofed, it's got a, 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 a bitumen tar roof, it's got uh, uh, granite countertops, and it houses eight people. It's lovely, and it can be assembled within a week or 10 days. And it costs all of $2,000 to make. And now you take that, and then you'd say, which market would I then apply it to? You would immediately think of, let me do slum te set tenements, you know, settlements and so forth. But then you'd flip that around and say where they actually tend to use that is, would be in conflict zones, where they want housing fixed immediately for shared housing for several people, uh, and, um, and uh, you, can, you can do that very quickly and disassemble and so forth. Now the problem with that, what happened, what they realized is that people from these conflict zones didn't want to leave the place because the houses were that good that they thought the house they have here is better than they ha had a, at back home. So they didn't want to leave. That created a different problem. Now the governments are saying, don't put these houses. Can we make different arrangements? Right. So here, yeah, but the solution is a very low cost, efficient, scalable solution. Right. So I'm asking you to start thinking about how will you make scope itself efficient? Okay, instead of thinking about scale, which I think is very important, certainly is very important, how can you think of scope? How can you think of a low cost but flexible solution? And can we think creatively in your business to make that happen? This one is a French word. Uh, it's bricolage. Essentially what that means is trying to create something, create value out of nothing. So you take something which people have discarded which was useless or not useful, and make it valuable. Um, this is, of course, a very lovely spider-like juicer to make orange juice or lime juice or whatever. Of course, it's very expensive. Here's another one that does the same juicing function, but using discarded bamboo stalks, which is sold alongside the Philippe stock juicer at probably 3% of the price. Okay. And you start thinking, how do you actually go and make the same 
functionality. Of course, design and everything else. The, this one was designed by the Royal College of Art. Right? So it wasn't some kid somewhere else coming up with ideas that don't make sense. Uh, it was designed by us uh, in, in our context, trying to figure out how can I figure out a low cost solution to a problem. So can I figure out ways in which I can make what we would otherwise say is useless uh, into useful products? A and um, many companies that um, I tend to engage with now are going back into their products, uh, materials usage and so forth, and then saying, what is recoverable in this? And if it's not useful for me, can I find somebody else that it would be useful for? And then can I share in that value downstream from that? Right. The last of the principles is focusing on core user need. That seems very simple. Um, and I say, why adding more actually gets you less? Here's the first example. Right? I'm, I, I showed this earlier in my class today, but uh, uh, some of you, I think, are, would know the answer. Have you seen this arm before? It's famous. It's a famous arm. No? It's come in movies. It's called the Luke Skywalker arm. All right. It, it, it can do anything. It can do everything. It can do lightsabers as well. All right? <laughs> so, so this one is um, about eighty, hundred thousand dollars It's it's multifunctional, very, very uh, sort of inspired in design. And clearly, a lot of work has gone into this research program. And they've done exceptionally well. Here's a slightly different one. This is a, 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 the cost for doing this is less than $20. And the prosthetic is, is no frills. So the people who would tend to use this, I think I've got a video off of this. I'll just show that to you. This girl, she lost her leg in a train accident. And she was hardly four years old. Yeah. And now she's from three years, uh, had a foot. Jaipur Foot makes and fits artificial limbs for free. They've developed an innovative technique that uses recycled flip-flop rubber and remolded industrial plumbing pipe. This means the costs are low and the limb is geared towards particular Indian needs. India has an extraordinary number of amputees. There are 25,000 new ones a year through accidents and diseases like polio. The victims are often illiterate and living below the poverty line. Jaipur Foot's program reaches across the nation through its centers and mobile camps. What's really am uh, amazing is uh, amputee comes in and within two hours he walks out. And so there's no, there's no forms that we have to fill when they walk in. There's no registration that they do. They walk in, they fit or rather they crawl in or they lift it in or whatever, and they will go out walking. Walking. OK, I think it froze my entire computer. <laughs> All right. James, will you see if you can fix this while I continue with my lecture? <laughs> Why waste time, right? So I can process without the slides. So in this example, what you've got, it, what you've got really, it, oh, did you do something? Uh, not for the face. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Partial. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thank you, James. So, so. Uh, Essentially in this, if you think about this, the functionality, two different types of prosthetic, right? So the first one had one arm that does everything. The second one is you could generate a foot for walking, for cycling, for running, for climbing coconut trees, and they make each one specific to the need, right? So what they realized was people really don't want to pay a lot for one thing that does everything. 
they're not lo looking at the Swiss Army knife version of, of, um, of prosthetics. Right. To make it affordable, what these guys did was they said, if it costs us around between $15 and $20 to make one, we'll make five. So you can come in and take five of these for five different uses and then change them as you need them. So that model is very different. Right? So you trying to stay, what is the actual user need, and then scaling it up from there is, is, is the core idea. Right? So uh, companies now like uh, GE in terms of their scanner, instead of having a 300,000 scanner, they have now have introduced a $15,000 version. So, and the $15,000 version, the nice thing about it is it's portable. So what they do now is they take these scanners to the villages around where there is not a nurse but a midwife who goes around who scans it and then sends images to the closest hospital which is about 50, 60 miles away. Right. And the doctor there sees it and then says, yeah, yeah, this is fine or not or whatever it is. Right. So the two things have happened here. One, first GE actually reducing the cost of their product from 300,000 to 15. Uh, that's itself a huge deal. And of course, um, GE is making a healthy profit on that 15, right? So it costs about 2,000 probably to make, and everything else is in between. So, but it, what it has done is it's revolutionized how the healthcare delivery actually works, right? Correct. Sure. Uh, uh, GE has actually gone through that exercise, right, to make, make sure what the applications they are, they can be used for. So they've reduced the number of applications they can use it for. But on the other hand, 90% of what, what people use scanners are for are babies in, in different far out places where they cannot bring the mother back to the hospital every time to have these scans. So because of that, it's changed the market that GE as a company has been able to reach. Right? So it's changed the market. It's changed the ability to deliver healthcare solutions uh, in an otherwise unreachable market. So I, I say by focusing on the core user need, what you do is you go after a niche, which you think is a niche, but actually turns out to be such a huge market because our predominant thinking is, of course, people will need all these. But what you realize is, not really. You, you use most of the functionality. I'm not sure about you folks, but uh, in my computer, I don't use everything that there is to use. Or when I use Word or PowerPoint, I don't use everything that there is to use. If we think about that and then say, what are the core things that people use? And then by having only those core things, would I be able to reduce the cost price to 5 10% of what that cost base is, and that would drastically change the market that we can reach. So I'm going to sort of stop there in terms of thinking of the principles, and then say, when we go around and say, what are hard constraints? Hard constraints to me are those that you cannot violate, because you're forcing yourself to, to stick to it. So if you say, my constraint is going to be, I have to make whatever the solution is, 10% of the cost that I would otherwise do. Or a selling price has to be 10%. And then you force yourself to think about what that market would be, as well as what that product would entail. Right. And many companies are now thinking about that in, that in this way. So some of you may be academics. Are any of you academics? There are a few, yes. Okay. So I, I've then taken this into our management theory and sort of said, what are the basis of which how we should rethink? Because we don't, even in management, we don't have uh, theoretical frameworks that allow us to explain this fully. So this past year, um, I wrote this paper along with a few of my colleagues uh, in looking at how you could do innovation for inclusive growth. And obviously in this, when I say inclusive growth, we are talking about expanding the market to reach markets that are unreachable. And in that, there are, there are three basic components that, are, that we actually say. The first one is 
reframe your constraints. What are the constraints and how can you rethink what those constraints are? The second one is, if you think of constraints, you also have to think of new business models. You cannot innovate at low cost and then put it into a business model that doesn't support it. So you have to start rethinking what is the business model that would sit with that. And the last one, if you're looking, I call it bridging access, but it's essentially redefining your market. Right? Uh, it's not that we would not use low cost objects. All right? In fact, all of us would be just about equally happy to use something which is incredibly inexpensive. Uh, we've gone somehow to believe that you know, the more expensive it is, the better it is. But rethinking some of that logic associated with that and changing your focus on the market, forming new partnerships to access different uh, communities, I think becomes important. And then I say these have implications for different theories of how we uh, uh, look at management itself in terms of how we look at resources, how we look at governance. What kind of partnerships would we form? Because clearly, if we're reaching different parts of the world or different parts of a market that we haven't reached, you have to look at different partnerships. And how do we make that work in a, in a way that's low cost? Um, how do we create networks? Uh, how do we, how do we uh, uh, sort of use social media, social networks actually to reduce costs? Can we think of marketing with, at, but at a fraction of the price uh, and therefore save huge amounts in, uh, in how we look at cost overheads? Uh, transaction cost. Can we change the way we think of each transaction? And can we, uh, can we figure out what would we make or buy and reduce that uh, cost basis? Um, obviously, competition and sort of strategy, I think, are universal issues. How do we engage stakeholders? Who are our stakeholders? Um, do government agencies then become stakeholders? Uh, do we get uh, uh, do we work with uh, larger companies because they are not able to do it themselves, but we can then do it for them? So, for example, in pharmaceuticals, there is this huge area of orphan drugs that has come up because pharmaceutical business model is about big drugs, blockbusters. Now, anything below a certain threshold, they're not able to do it themselves, but they hold the intellectual property. So what they are very happy to do now is you, you show up and say, I will do the research, I will form a consortium of folks and try to deliver this at a lower cost for a market which is much smaller, but it's still viable because I do it at a lower cost. Right? So right now we are focusing on diseases such as uh, heart attacks and diabetes and you know, things that, are, that affect a lot of us, but, but uh, those that uh, make a lot of money for pharmaceutical companies, right? Because they're, over time, their business model has been entrenched into that model. Huge lab space, huge amounts of investment, therefore they need huge payoffs to pay off that, uh, that overhead cost. Now, if they have to rethink it and then say, can I create drugs for diseases that are unique and rare for 5,000 people? Right. And right now, there is no model to do that. So if we can restructure some of these partnerships, and the pharmaceutical companies are the first to realize that they cannot do it, and now they're opening up their IP portfolio, I think that's very interesting for us to do. And what kind of practices, if we were running our own business, what kind of practices would we think of to actually lower cost? So somewhere in between, we've lost that cost element. And so I'm going to end my uh, talk with the idea and encouraging you, like the CEO who who inspired me to think about this, go be cheap. I think that's a good thing. Right. Thank you very much.